All right, we're live. Thanks everyone for tuning in, having a fun time catching up with folks here on the Zoom. Uh, as uh, I was away last week and uh, good to see folks again. Hmm, so yeah, I had to look at my calendar to see when this happened. It was only a week and a half ago. It, yeah, a week and a half ago, but it seems like so long ago. The summer's been very full, um, but wonderful. And yeah, so a week and a half ago, I had the very happy fortune or, or wonderful opportunity to uh, visit the Rumi exhibit at um, the Aga, Aga Khan Museum in Toronto. And uh, that exhibit is on until October 1st. And Rumi, if I'm is a uh, you've likely heard of um, Rumi, commonly known as Rumi, is Jalal al Din Muhammad Rumi, um, was a 13th century poet and Sufi mystic and scholar, um, very prolific and beautiful contributions to wisdom and to our world. And uh, it was a lovely exhibit. It's a beautiful museum anyways. Um, uh, just letting somebody in here. Um, so even, I, I, I plan to go back there to see the rest of the other exhibits that are on there. Uh, there's, there's a lot of uh, beauty and wisdom and incredible art. So, I'm just going to speak about one aspect of this Rumi exhibit. Uh, there's so much, but there was one. I think they called it "elephant in the dark" in in their descriptions, and uh, you kind of walked into this partitioned area with dark walls that they'd put up, dark partitions that had. Uh, pieces of elephant sculpture, elephant anatomy sculptures that were kind of like crystalline, like, and you were encouraged to touch them, which was so great. Museums that let you touch things is already a win. Um, and I was familiar with this story, so I was really enjoyed just spending some time there, closing my eyes and feeling these different, like the elephant's foot and I think they had another part that was, I can't re even remember what the parts were, maybe ear, tail, I remember the foot. <laughs> and um, they also had some videos that would show um, of those parts of the elephant. So it's referring to a, what would you call it, a parable that's cited in many spiritual traditions. Um, there's versions in Hindu scriptures, in Jain texts. Um, there was a Persian poet before Rumi that wrote about this parable. And um, that was a poet named Sanai, S-A-N-A apostrophe. Uh, I. Um, and Rumi reportedly really revered this scholar and poet and then wrote his own version of this story. Um, and um, this was first, uh, well, I don't know if there's other versions before that, maybe in oral history, but it was um, in, it's in the Buddhist suttas from like 500 BCE before all these other um, versions. So I was familiar with it. Uh, so I found the sutta and I uh, wanna share some thoughts, reflections on, on this elephant in the dark. It comes from a sutta that's called the Titha Sutta, T-I-T-T-H-A. 
which I think means views. I didn't have time to get the Poly English Dictionary out, but uh, that's pretty sure that's what it is. It's if you're interested in looking up suttas, it's in the Udana, so it's U D six point four. But you don't need to know anything about suttas or referencing to mm, hear the wisdom of this teaching. So um, I'll just kind of uh, give some synopsis and read some parts of the sutta. So mm, this is happening at a, a place, Jetta's Grove, where a lot of uh, monastics and wandering ascetics would gather and, um, and live around that area. And it was in this story and at, at many other times, there's many different people from different sects, religions, um, traditions, belief systems, etc., gathering in this area. And so, um, as it says here, there were some recluses, so people that have left the home life the lay life um, to become a recluse and Brahmins. And they were, there's these different views that were going back and, and forth. So some would really argue, really um, expound and, and put forth their beliefs that the world is eternal. And they don't just like, Mm, hold that lightly I think the world may be eternal <laughs> I don't really know but that's my sense of it you know but they were really like the world is eternal only this is true and any other view is false so not only you know is my view true but everything else is untrue and then of course there's others that would take the opposite view the world is not eternal and they would say only this is true and everything else is false. Some of the other arguments happening at this time were that the world is finite and others would say the world is infinite. So it's not lasting forever and it's boundless and others would say the opposite. Another one is that some of these translations used the word soul and some said the word life principle. Um, I wasn't able to find the exact which Pali word they were. Pali is the language the Buddhist teachings were first written down in that these suttas are being translated into English from. And so I think they probably is probably the word atman a t m a n which is related to what the buddha taught anatta so atman they some are arguing that the life principle and the body are the same thing and others are saying that the life principle and the body are different things Another argument was that the Tathagata exists beyond death. Tathagata means the one thus gone. It's like an honorific title, meaning referring to the Buddha, the one who has uh, awakened, uh, found liberation, um, the one thus gone. Yeah. So they're saying the Buddha exists beyond death and others would argue the Buddha does not exist beyond death. And, and then some would argue that both are true. Both ex the Buddha both exists and does not exist beyond death. And then others would argue the opposite, that neither is true, does not exist, um, neither exists nor does not exist beyond death. Anyways, that's a lot of words. Everyone's arguing. <laughs> that's a short form. But they're arguing about really important things and uh, strongly held views that maybe you can relate to um, if you've if you've uh, gone home for Christmas or Thanksgiving. 
<laughs> any crowd where there's um, a gathering of people with lots of different views about the meaning of life and is there a soul and is life eternal am i eternal all these things which are are pretty strongly held beliefs often and um understandable and so as i was saying they don't only they're not only saying this is true but they say everything else is false and so they live and they, at this time was very quarrelsome disputes wrangling and wounding each other with verbal darts <laughs> we can relate to that that happens um so they're saying the dharma dharma is like this not like that not like this it's like that hmm so this is going on and really getting Mm, exaggerated and lots of quarreling of course then they um a number of them uh go to the buddha for uh and present uh bowing to the buddha and they present what's going on that all these different views and lots of quarreling and fighting from the wanderers and recluses and brahmins of the different sects S-E-C-T, sounds like I'm saying sex, but I'm not. Okay, so mm, the Buddha responds, uh, the wanderers of other sex, Buddhas, bhikkhus, are blind, unseeing, he says. They do not know what is beneficial. They don't know what is harmful. So he's pointing out what's important here. What's beneficial? What's harmful? They do not know what is the Dharma or Dhamma. And they don't know what is not Dhamma. Not knowing what is beneficial, what's harmful, what's the Dhamma, what is not. They are quarreling like this. And then he tells a story of a former time when a king was living in this area and uh, the king uh, asked one of his attendants to bring all the people to Savati who have been blind from birth. So, yes, your majesty, and they go off and round up all the people that have been blind from birth. And then, uh, yes, they've all been gathered, Your Majesty. And then the king says, now bring the blind people an elephant. Very well, the blind people, the elephant is brought. And so um, the elephant is presented to this gathering of uh, folks that have been blind from birth. And they say to to them, this is an elephant, um, check it out. And so uh, some uh, people are presented with, um, to, to feel the tusk of the elephant. Others are feeling the trunk and others are feeling the whole body, the, the torso um, or the back. Others feel the foot. Others the leg, others uh, the hindquarters. Some are feeling the tail, and some are feeling the tuft of the tail, the end of the tail with the fluff on it. And uh, each of them are saying, "This is an elephant. I'm checking out an elephant." And so and then the king says, "Tell me, blind people, what is an elephant?" Of course, we get these different descriptions. The, um, the, the person that felt the head of the elephant, you can imagine this huge big head that feels hard on the outside. And they say, um, this, the uh, elephant, your majesty is just like a water jug, like a big container that holds water. Someone who was feeling the ear of the elephant uh, 
said that it was just like a an elephant is just like a winnowing basket. A winnowing basket is like a shallow basket that is used to um, toss grain into the air, you know, to uh, get the the the, the chaff chaff off the grain. So they're like it's a winnowing basket. So that's what the the big ear felt like like a woven basket that's shallow. Um, let's see, what else? The uh, tusk of the elephant, they said was, uh, an, they said, they didn't know it was just the tusk. They say, an elephant, your majesty, is just like a plowshare. Plowshare is the, cuts the top layer of the soil when they're tilling the fields. <clears throat> And the trunk was just like a plow pole, so the pole of the plow. And someone that felt the the um, torso said it's just like an, an elephant is just like a storehouse or a grain storehouse that you would store the grain, the granary. Um, the foot is like a post. The hindquarters. This was an odd one. The hindquarters is like a mortar and the tail is like a pestle, pestle, like mortar and pestle. It's like a bowl that you with a stick that you grind. Um, and the tuft of the tail, so that a uh, person that felt the tuft of the tail said it's just like a broom. An elephant is just like a broom. They're not saying the tail, they're saying an elephant is just like a broom. So he, it's interesting that even in this sutta, as I said, through time over these uh, thousands of years with these different translations, there's all kinds of different versions um, that, which make more sense to um, my sense of language and meaning being in a different period of time, that uh, the ear is like carpet, like broad, rough and spreading piece of carpet. Uh, yeah, doesn't matter. All these different versions. The trunk is like a snake, tusk like a spear, etc. Um, and so, uh, then after this story, uh, the Buddha continues saying that an elephant is like this. An elephant is not like that. You could see they. And someone else says, an elephant's not like that, it's like this. They all start arguing together, just like all the all the uh, people in, in the grove that are arguing together about their beliefs. Of course, he makes this connection through this story. And um, this, this collection of suttas in um, the Udana collection are all short teaching short suttas and they all end with a little a short hmm, what do you say short quote or utterance a short verse by the buddha and this is the one translation of that verse he says some recluses and brahmins so called are deeply attached to their own views people who only see one side of things engage in quarrels and disputes and that's that's the end of his pithy very punctual teaching so when we are deeply attached to our own views and uh, to we're only seeing one side of things we become very quarrelsome and uh, argumentative in uh trying to justify our position. Uh, in Sinai's version, that poet that Rumi was uh, inspired by, he ends his poem by saying, no mind knew the whole. Um, in his in later versions also they don't talk about blind people but they talk about people in the dark like they just put the elephant in a big dark space and it's totally dark so it's not really about being blind of course um it's just about views and if we're seeing clearly seeing uh the whole um and really when you think about it 
our, our brain, which we give so much value to, our brain, what we think and what we know, what we think we know, what we perceive, really our brain is blind. The brain is can't see, is just inside this <laughs> hard thing. Uh, and it's just receiving electrical impulses from our other sense doors and very limited information, extremely limited. When we look at other animals and what we know about all there is to perceive, we're perceiving very little. Uh, so our brain that we may be so enamored with, our views and our perceptions is very limited and is in fact like a one who is not seeing. Rumi, in his version, ended his poem with this. It's a little bit different. He says, because uh, they're touching with their hands, he says, the sense of the eye, the eye sense door, is like the palm of the hand. That's it. And the hand can never touch the whole thing. So whether you're talking about our hand, our eye, our mind, we cannot touch the whole thing. We don't know. We're, we have very limited biased perceptions from our history and from our mm, culture, from our gender, from our all, all of our conditioning. And you can see in this story that each of them is wrong, but each of them is partly right. They're partly right. And, and they're fighting and warring about something that none of them have actually seen in its totality or known in its totality, in its wholeness. There's a philosopher named Ken Wilbur. Um, and a philosopher, author, teacher, who says it this way. He says, I have one major rule. Everybody is right. <laughs> I don't know. Can you resonate with that? More specifically, he says, everybody, including me, has some important pieces of the truth. I've got the tail, you've got the ear. We've all got some pieces of the truth, all of us. And all of those pieces need to be honored, cherished, and included in a more generous, gracious, he says, spacious and compassionate embrace. My goodness, would that be a different world? <laughs> but it can be a different heart a different heart mind for us you just pause and and this is my point of view from all of my conditioning and even though both of us are at the same place at the same time experiencing the same thing we're going to have different views just slightly different experience of it or very different experience so if we can remember this maybe we won't be so quarrelsome we could be more compassionate we could try to hear well what is the the piece of this that they know is true like what is the, what is their experience which part of it are they seeing this is what i'm seeing this is what you're seeing and together can we have a sense of a bigger picture Maybe even then, not the whole picture. Hmm. Okay. So that is some thoughts on the elephant, uh, elephant in the dark, rather than referring to blind people. I like that version of elephant in the in the dark. Um, And it, to reflect or notice when you get argumentative, when I get argumentative, I certainly do. <laughs> I certainly do. Hopefully I can remember. 
I might need to get an elephant tattoo, I'm thinking now. <laughs> I have lots of rememberings inked into my body. I might need an elephant to remember. It's just part of the picture. What, it, what do we actually know is true? I was also thinking today about how this can happen internally with my different parts. One of my, one aspect of myself, one part of myself thinks this is true. You know, how often does that happen where like, oh, this is true about me or, or about you or about the world. And we're, we're so convinced and just to see, okay, that's part, that part's true. It's not the whole truth. This can be liberating. Definitely liberating. Okay, so let's practice to calm our hearts and minds and to awaken to what do we actually know in the present moment, not what someone tells us, not what our sense stores are um, perceiving through um, all of our filters, but in the direct experience here and now, what's happening. Let's practice awakening. So as we transition to the practice, please uh, adjust your space as you need. If you want to dim your lights or turn away from the computer, which is probably a good idea. <laughs> um, if you need any other comforts for your body, we usually uh, sit for about 25 minutes here. If you need to log off earlier, do what you need. Just going to... the time. Hmm. So as you're adjusting your posture and finding a standing, sitting, reclining, or even walking uh, posture that's supportive for your awakening and for peace. So kindness to your body. Mm -hmm. Take your time here to any movements you need or looking around your space. You're welcome to practice with eyes open or eyes closed. And that was uh, a lot of words with a lot of energy coming quickly. So see if you can just let them dissipate like, like feathers settling. Like rain on hot stone dissolving, just let it all go. What's needed to be known will remain. And we take time here just to allow the body to arrive here and now with awareness. Take some time just to feel into the area of the head. Thinking of the elephant's head here. And just feel what does your head feel like right now? Is there flutteriness, busyness, heaviness, dullness? Tension. And 
And then sensing and feeling into the area of the face, inviting softness, ease, relaxation as much as possible. Feel across and through the areas of the neck and throat, inviting these muscles to lengthen as the shoulders rest down. And the weight of the shoulders resting down through the arms into relaxed hands. The relaxed hands remind the belly center, the heart center to let go a little bit, soften, widen. Check out the inner layers of the belly that can be activated when there's stress and tension. Let's see if that can soften or let go a little bit. Now we can feel perhaps a little more weightedness, presence, heaviness through the hips. Down the legs. Feel into the feet and contact with the ground. And from paying attention to these, some of these different parts of the body, now we can just rest here and open to the whole experience of the body, whether it's sitting, reclining, standing, walking, as if there's a sphere of awareness around the whole body, like a bubble, like an aura. And just feel a whole body right now. You don't have to feel everything about the body or anything in particular. Just a simple, simple awareness. There is this body in this moment. Sensations arising and passing are like this. Let's rest here in the silence together for a few minutes.
when we notice the mind has moved off into other thoughts and plans, worries, fantasy. Very gently, just come back and open to the sensations of the body in the present moment. If resting awareness with the whole body feels uh, too large or loose or um, not enough of an anchor for awareness because of causes and conditions in this moment, you might choose to gather awareness with one part of the body, sensations of the hands perhaps, or sensations of breath, what feels like a most supportive place to rest and gather and calm.
And we might very lightly have the sense that whatever we're perceiving and experiencing is just, just as part of the whole experience of this body, this being, this aliveness. And we bring lots of curiosity and attention to knowing, oh, it's like this right now. We might also lightly touch an awareness of some of the different parts of ourselves that are here. All of these pieces to be honored, cherished, included in a more gracious, spacious, and compassionate embrace. And in these last few minutes of the practice, noticing what's arising, there may arise restlessness, boredom, doubt, sleepiness, and can we just see this as just a part of the picture, an awareness, 
can be okay with that, arising and passing. The last few minutes of practice can be the most fruitful when we meet them with wisdom, spaciousness, compassion. Thank you for sharing practice with us and um, I'll put the links down below for the sutta and uh, the 
roomy exhibit at, at the museum uh, and and some other bits perhaps <laughs> so um we come here next week am i yes i am uh yeah for the next two weeks so hope to see you again or uh thank you for joining us on the recording on youtube <laughs>